Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Self Helpless Podcast. I'm Delaney Fisher. Kelsey Cook is not able to be here today, but I am joined by wonderful guest, Nicole Baker. Nicole is a life and mindset coach for perfectionists. She helps perfectionists not only set goals, but actually follow through with them. And Nicole opens up about a lot in this episode. She talks about being raised by parents who have a background in personal development and how that shaped her. And I also want to give a disclaimer here that Nicole opens up about experiencing bullying as a kid, emotional and physical abuse in a romantic relationship that she had as a teenager, as well as experiencing disordered eating in college. So obviously proceed with caution if you feel you might be triggered by any of these topics. And Nicole is actually one of my incredible clients. I've had the pleasure of being her business coach for a year now, and we are continuing our work together this next year as well. And anyone who has come across Nicole knows that she is a ray of fucking sunshine. Her energy is infectious. You can feel her empathy and compassion when she speaks. And I have been able to witness her go from having a dream and an idea of what she wanted to do with her experience and her skill set to recently being able to leave her day job to run her coaching business full time. And I could not be more thrilled for her. And I'm so honored I get to be a part of this huge milestone in her career. She has done a lot of work to get to this point. And I felt her story and her experience experiences would resonate with so many of our listeners, and I'm very happy to be sharing her with you all. So here's my conversation with Nicole Baker. Nicole, thank you so much for being here today. I cannot wait to have this conversation with you. This is quite literally a dream come true. So um, you're welcome for being here today. (laughs) Yes. Um, So please, do you have a quote that you would like to share with myself and our lovely audience? You know, I do. I was listening to a podcast the other day. It was not self-helpless. Unfortunately, (laughs) I know I'm the worst. Um, I was listening to a podcast the other day and Martha Beck was a guest on there and she's like Oprah's life coach and like all this stuff. And she's, you know, totally unsuccessful. She has nothing going for her right now. Um, no, she's like my idol. And she said this, she said, if what you're doing isn't working, stop doing it harder. Oh my gosh. I can't believe we haven't heard that quote on this show yet. That is so excellent. She said that, and I'm pretty sure my stomach like leapt and vomited out of my face. Like yeah, I was just so like, good. whoa, that is so true because so much of what I've done and so much who I work with now, it's like people who are push, 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 push. And that is just like to a T what I keep hearing over and over again. It's like, I am doing everything right, quote unquote. So why am I not happy? Mm. And it's like, oh my God, that quote just seal the deal. Seal yeah. It. That's such a good one. That really resonates with me too about, you know, if something feels really complicated, there's probably something else going on. Like things yes. don't usually have to be that complicated. And this idea that we can move through certain situations or careers or whatever it might be with more ease than we allow ourselves to, that definitely, that quote hit there for me big time. Um, Oh yeah. Big time. (laughs) Such a good one. Well, already crushing it, Nicole. So fantastic quotable. Stop it. Thank you. (laughs) Now I would, um, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about yourself, your background, what you do now before we kind of get into all the, the juiciness. You got it. My name is Nicole Baker. I am a life and mindset coach. I specifically work with perfectionists on not only setting goals and getting really clear on their goals, but actually following through with them because that mm. seems to kind of be the little disconnect with a lot of per- perfectionists because if they have to be perfect to go after anything, how can we ever live up to those expectations? So I work with people really on that. However, there's a big like kind of spoiler alert plot twist that I do with people. <laughs> and that is a lot of the times the reason we're not going after these big, hairy, scary, audacious goals we have is because we feel 
like we're not enough. We feel like we don't have the voice, the intelligence, the skill level, the audience, the Instagram followers, whatever it is, enough to go after this full goal. So I really work with people on tapping into their power, tapping into their voice and unlocking that. And then the goal kind of just vomits through that. So like it, it really works well, but me personally, I grew up in a personal development family. So I've been listening to this stuff my whole life. But while I, I say that a lot and people are like, oh, okay. So, you know, you've always been like happy guru pants, like <laughs> super energetic. <laughs> like you've always been a real go-getter and like, nah. and I'm like, you yeah. could not be spitting more lies. Like that is just so not the case. I mm. um, will obviously dive super into this, but I did not have a voice. I did not trust my voice. I was so scared to speak my own mind for so long that while I was listening to that personal development stuff from such a young age and learning about it, I wasn't implementing it. Mm. And when I started implementing it, that's when everything unlocked and changed. That's so fascinating to hear that because you usually hear people um, finding personal development tools much later on in life, not being like birthed into it with all these different (laughs) mindset (laughs) hacks and stuff, right? So I'm so curious to to hear um, how do you feel how do you feel like growing up in that environment shaped you? Were there pros and cons to it? Did you feel like you have a head start? (laughs) I yeah, would love for you to expand (sighs) on that. Head start, yes. I, I will go ahead and say the head start, yes, because I was so familiar with the language. By the time I started implementing it, I was like, oh, that's what I've been missing, but I get it. I get how everything's connected. There were there were cons, yes. It was it was a very um I, I grew up when when I was very young and I didn't have the language for it then, but I have and will always be a major empath, which for maybe listeners who don't know, that is just a person who wears their emotions on their sleeves. They absorb emotions really easily. And when they feel something, there is no like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like on the emotional scale, it's zero or 10. Like that is it. That's all you got. Mm-hmm. And as a kid, I would feel all these emotions at this level 10, every single time, 10. I was happy, 10. I was sad, 10. I was angry, 10. Didn't matter. And whenever I would feel these emotions so highly, I would just cry. Didn't matter. Happy, sad, didn't matter. Just cry. Because it was so painful to keep them inside that I just like had to burst them out. And with the family and the, the old, I'm going to say the old personal development model, because this is really n- what was taught in like the seventies, eighties, nineties, where it was like, if you're not happy, change it. If you're not happy, that's not productive, change it. And right. my parents were never evil or forceful. They're my best friends in the world, but there was a lot of that, like, how can we make this a positive emotion? How can we make this empowering? And sometimes as a little mm-hmm. kid, I was just like, I just need to cry. And so right. it, it, they, they never said this outright, but it enveloped this, this really deep belief in me that if I am emotional, I'm a burden, or if I have emotions, I'm a burden unto others. Mm. And that honestly, I will go ahead and say, I was not able to say that sentence until last December. Like that's how long it stayed with me until I really started to figure things out yeah. and uncover a bunch of stuff. But it it was it was a lot of really good and then there was that one that i was like ooh that that sunk deep and i didn't realize how deep it sunk mm, yeah mm-hmm. so almost like you know obviously not meaning to but we've we've talked a little bit about toxic positivity totally. on the show before, and sometimes that way of thinking can make you feel like your emotions you know are a problem you know, or they're not valid or they can be fixed with the snap of a finger. So Mm -hmm. that's interesting that, you know, that kind of old way of thinking, I think is definitely, you know, it's a thing of the past now and people are starting to talk about emotions in a, in a very different way. I think there's definitely still some like personal development gurus, I guess I'll say out there who really preach the, like, if you're not happy, change it. If you're not happy, hustle. If you're not happy, keep going. Like it's, it goes back to that thing we were just talking about. If what you're doing isn't working, stop doing it harder. But there's preaching this, like push through, push through. And I could not be more 
against that. I I personally do not believe that model works. I believe that you have to feel what you feel so deeply because if you just keep shoving it down, it's just not going to go away. Right. And if you feel what you feel so deeply, you're able to really connect, really identify what it is, feel it. And then you can go from there. You can keep going and throw yourself the world's biggest. I suck. The world sucks. Let me cry for a hot minute party. Yeah. Or you can say, you know what? I've really felt this. I've emotionally identified what's going on in my body, but I also know that there's something good that's out of it. I'm going to go down that route or a mix of the two. It's not that black and white. Like Mm -hmm. there's so many options that are not just push, push, push. Absolutely. And then when you get into that kind of push, push, push mode, if you are falling into that trap, you become, you're not really present in your life. You know, you're not, you're not allowing yourself to stop and feel your feelings and you might end up just doing things just to do them and wake up one day with a life that you fucking hate because you didn't actually get in touch with, what you actually want, what you don't want, what you're doing just because you think you need to or should. Um, So yeah, that's really fascinating that from such a young age, you knew about all this stuff, but, you know, the implementation obviously helped you kind of know it on a whole different level, you know, knowing something in theory and then knowing something through experience is very, very different. So would you say growing up in that environment inspired the work that you do now, or did you have any childhood experiences that kind of led you down this path of helping perfectionists basically find their self-worth, right? And, And build that foundation for them to go after their their goals? The answer is, is yes. And yes. Um, my, my dad is a life coach. And so following in his footsteps, not like, because it feels like the Baker family motto or whatever, (laughs) but because it's like, I grew up listening to his clients' stories and hearing that. And I'm just like, Ooh, I want to give that to people. So that definitely influenced what I do right now in a very, very heavy way. However, that clarity really didn't come until much, much, much later. Um, when I was a little kid, I, again, I would, like I said, big emotions and, you know, among a lot of other kids who are too cool for school, they didn't really, it, it made me easy, easy prey. And I was really, really bullied. I was also a kid that was leaning a little bit overweight. I lived in a very, um, skinny driven town, Mm -hmm. uh, which now it's leaning a lot more health oriented, which I'm really glad about, but it is still really like, if you have fat on you, people look down on you and it, it Mm. it really bothers me, but that's a whole other podcast. (laughs) Um, but I, growing up with that model in your ear and the kids around me would, would, you know, call me names. They would, point and laugh if I was crying or feeling something or like I could, I would like, I I eventually developed a defense mechanism where I would like try not to cry, but I would like end up twisting my face in like such odd ways. And they would like twist them up also and point at me and laugh and like all these things. And it's like, oh, it was, I I would not recommend it to a friend. (laughs) That's for sure. But it, Mm. it, it shaped so much of who I am now because the resiliency, the skin that had to be built up through those experiences. In fact, I remember one time um, I was out to dinner with a friend and there are two, two twins. It was their birthday and we were all out to dinner and we were all sitting around this table and I needed to go to the bathroom. So I went and I couldn't tell you what age I was, probably seven, maybe eight, maybe younger. And the two twins came to the bathroom and started beating me up. Like, and like, they like threw me into the stall and they like closed the door. I like locked it because I was like terrified. And they like would swipe under the thing. So I had to like stand on the toilet and like, I was like crying like crazy. And they were like yelling all these scary names and horrible things at me. And I remember, I remember staying there a while after they had left and they were like laughing on their way back or whatever. And I just remember staying there and I was crying and I was trying to hold it together. I was like, I can't walk out of there like this. I can't walk out of there like this. And I, I eventually had to obviously go back and join the party. And I, I sat down and my eyes were puffy. I would obviously been crying. I was like so small. I just remember being so small and sitting there and no one said anything. And like, there were adults there. And I just remember a very vivid moment of, I am not enough. 
no matter what I do, I will never be enough. And that really ingrained and shaped a very large portion of my life, obviously for not a great reason um, and many not great reasons afterward, but there, there was such a moment also in that right after the, I'm not enough. It was also like, wow, this is further confirming my emotions aren't worthy. My emotions are a burden. Like no one will pay attention to these. And that's when I, I it's, it's funny. Sorry. This is like a very long story, but it's no, funny. I'm sorry. I, I'm like getting emotional. <laughs> I swear. I, no. I hate everything now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my God. Oh I my just, goodness. It's just crazy. Be, obviously I know you so well. And just the thought of little Nicole being treated like that just breaks my fucking heart. Oh, you're going to get me now. Continue. <laughs> Please continue. No, you're good. Um, yeah, I just like, it was, it was just such a, uh, uh, a, a traumatizing experience. And I remember you and I talking about, uh, like kind of ch- chatting about this, this episode a while ago. And I was telling you, I was like, most of the stuff I all, I also don't even remember. Mm. And, and that's, what's scary. This bathroom story really stands out because that was the moment I remember becoming really small, um, and shutting off my voice pretty, pretty drastically. But I mean, there are also probably so many other memories that I haven't unlocked and there's, I've done so much healing around it. And like, they, they do come up like as I uncover a new level and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm now in a point where when another one comes up, I like really allow gratitude for it. Um, because it means I'm, I'm, I'm leaning more in and not shutting it down, Mm. but it it was so much. So like I blocked out so much of that time where I just thought I was so small that my mom was actually just cleaning out photos in our basement, like last week. And she was sending me all these photos from this time. And I looked like such a happy kid. And I was like, so like, like smiled in every photo and all this stuff. And I'm just like, I don't remember her. Like she does not match who I remember being. And it was just very like, it, it had had a very like, I don't know. There, there's just so, there's so many moments that I just don't even remember now. And I'm, I'm for right now. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Obviously as things go, I, I want to keep remembering things to un- unpack that level of healing, but anyway. Yeah. Wow. I, what you said, that's such a powerful way to look at that. The fact that you said that, um, when these memories do kind of hit you now, you look at it as, you know, with gratitude, because it means that you're open to maybe processing some Mm -hmm. things and maybe even getting just more and more connected with yourself where, um, you know, I would say generally, and I'm speaking for myself too. If I have a painful memory, it's like the, the initial reaction is to like, push it away. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to think about this right now, but I love that idea of that. It's an opportunity for growth in some way. I'm a little curious about this situation just because I just, uh, it's just a, it's a horrible, horrible story. And I'm so sorry you went through that. And so was this like a birthday party? Like, were your parents there? You said there were adults there and nobody kind of saw this happen. Like there, it was a birthday party. There were adults there. My mom was not, but I remember her picking me up and I didn't tell her what happened. Wow. That was um, be my next question. Yeah. I, I, that was, that was kind of like where the, the, my emotions are a burden where I was like, don't tell. And the only person I really opened up to about these experiences were my grandma um, she's also a fellow empath. So that's probably why, cause she, I like got in the car from school and I like had been bullied all day and stuff like that. And I'd like get in the car and she would immediately be like, what's wrong? Like what's going on? You can talk to me. Mm. And we were so connected. She's up in wherever the ether verse, she's literally just <laughs> looking down and she's amazing. I cherish that woman and her energy so much, but, um, yeah, she was really the only person I ever opened up to about it until I finally told my parents many years later. Mm. Wow. So it's so you already kind of had this pre-existing feeling like my emotions are are a burden just because maybe some of the personal development stuff and of course this is not um speaking ill of your parents in any way but just no, that, no, no. that that environment can definitely bring that up and then almost like as a little kid you keep getting that confirmation that your emotions are a burden or they make you weird or different or some, not enough. That is a lot to unlearn and unpack as you get older. And do you feel that 
getting bullied in that way as a kid, um, do you think it carried on as you got older, like into teenage, teenager space or adulthood to where you were more, you kept being susceptible to that type Mm. of treatment to basically mistreatment by people? Definitely. I, um, when I, when I was in high school, I, I really connected with theater and I loved it. And that's where I really started to find my voice and come alive. And I would, um, love singing and I loved playing piano and I loved just like expressing my voice through that. Cause it felt so natural. Um, but I would always flock to the friend groups of people who were, who, who I'd put on a pedestal. Like I would, I would think that their voices always mattered more than mine. Their opinions were always more than mine. Um, and that, that really shaped so much of those years. And I actually, um, so much so I actually ended up falling into uh, a relationship with a, a guy and he, he, and he was courting me and it was, it was so beautiful. I felt like this like princess and it was almost like, a, oh my gosh, someone sees me, someone cares about me. And, you know, I was also like the fat kid. So I was like, oh my gosh, someone thinks I'm pretty. Like I, I felt so good. This is when I was starting to like really come into my own and into my own body. And he ended up being not a good guy. Well, just put that in very blunt words. Um, it ended up starting with emotional abuse. He would look at my arms and I had, I have like dark brown hair. Naturally, this is not real. And like, um, you like look at my arms and call me Sasquatch and be like, you should really like shave those. Those are gross. Like, Mm -hmm. um, and, and like where that, where it was like, Oh, like maybe I need to do this to please him. Or maybe I need to do this to please him. And it eventually evolved into physical abuse. And, um, like, I, that's another thing where I'm just like, Ooh, those are, those are another level of things where I've definitely blocked out certain moments. But the, the, one of the moments I really remember is actually coming home from having hung out with him. And my dad like pulled me aside. He's like, I see bruises on your arms. What is going on? Like, are you okay? And I was just like, Oh, I had a lighting incident at the theater. Like I was hanging up some lights. Ha ha. It was fine. And my parents are so trustworthy and so awesome that they, they were like, oh, okay, like, sounds good. Let keep us posted. Like, let us know. And, um, I stayed in that, that relationship on and off for oh God, two years. I think I, if I'm remembering correctly to about two years until I finally woke up and left him. And I remember when I sat down with him to leave him and break up with him. And it was, it was one of those instances and, um, I've, I've noticed this with my friends at the time who were also in relationships that were maybe physically or mentally abusive and the future wise also you, you hear your friends say like, Hey, this is not great. Hey, he called you this, like, Hey, he grabbed you like that. Is that like, what's going on? And it's like, Oh no, that's just how it is. Like, Oh no, that's just mm-hmm. how it is until you have that moment of like, whoa, this is not right. And it's like, I, it was almost like waking up from like a fog or a slumber. And that day I was like, it's over, it's done. I have to do this. And so I sat down with him and they told him like, Hey, it's over. And I just remember he took my, I was like sitting cross-legged on a table and he like took my knees and like shoved me into the wall and like left. And I was just like, I've made the best decision of my life just now. Like that was, that was just like further confirmation. This is it. This is done. And I like leaned into my friends so strongly by then I had really like started to find friends who cherished fun and, and joy. Um, and especially that came with finding the theater, but that was the moment where I was like, I need to choose something differently. I need to value myself more because the people I'm choosing to be around are not doing that. And that's my choice. I get to choose those people. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Obviously. Thank you for opening up about that. Um, Can you, can you expand on, you kind of said that there's, there was maybe a moment that you realized that this was not okay. Obviously it had been normalized for you um, in Mm -hmm. many, probably many ways, right? Just taking the mistreatment, not really saying anything. Um, What was there a certain moment that you were like, no more. And what was going through your head? I had been getting kind of, uh, 
using the waking up from the fog example, I'd been getting kind of like eye flutters for a few weeks where I'd like Mm. notice like a, Oh, that doesn't make me feel very good. That that's something he used to do and it was fine, but why is it different now? And just like those little teeny tiny things that my brain started noticing, like, Whoa, this is really wrong. And this is obvious. I, this I'm many years out of this. I'm, I'm, I'm able to talk about it in such a different way than I ever would have been able to 10 years ago. Yeah. But um, I th- having those like little teeny tiny brain, it's like the cogs were starting to turn. And it was, I was hanging out with my friends one day and I had been hanging out with him earlier and I'd had a mistreatment by him. I think he like grabbed me in a certain way. And it was when he grabbed me that I was like, Ooh, I'm done. I'm done here. And I told my friends in that moment, I was like, I'm going upstairs to do this. Make sure I come back down. Like make sure I am not up there with him long. Make sure I come back down. I am safe. All this stuff. And they're the two best people in the world. I'm still best friends with them today. Mm. Um, They did that and they're incredible, but I, I leaned into my friends really. That's that's like after I had the moment, I leaned into them for comfort and and solace and safety. Mm. And the moment where you said your dad noticed bruises on your arms, mm-hmm. right? What was going on through your head? Like what was what what were you why were you scared to tell him the truth? Oh, good question. I don't know if I've ever asked that that question to myself. Why was I scared? I think I was scared because. I didn't want the guy to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was like major people pleaser tendency because if he got in trouble, I think there was a little part of me was like, Ooh, then what will happen to me? Um, But also if he got in trouble, then maybe that means I have to leave him. And I was so like in the drama love, I was so like, I'm in love with him in love with him. And um, I was afraid to let that part us. And I knew that if, I had mentioned to my dad that this is what the case was. He would have gone full, full Papa Bear, like Mm -hmm. I would hope most parents would do. So, Mm -hmm. wow. So, basically, you know, for you, you kind of mentioned it was the moment, you know, he had grabbed you and then your friends played a huge role. Do you feel like the more that you kind of, you know, relied on people who were very healthy and was this around the time where you said you were getting into like theater and finding your voice? So do you feel like some of those other things really contributed to maybe your self worth, realizing your self worth and feeling like you had the courage to, to break that off? I think one trillion thousand million percent. That was when everything really started connecting together. And, and like you said, I started really finding my own voice and started using it in ways that made me feel good and made me feel like me rather than me, who I was trying to be for everyone else. And that I ended up going into a musical theater college and that, that really carried over. And I, I was trying to find my voice through there and, and definitely had some, some moments throughout the way, but um, that was when things started really, really g- gaining that momentum. And I started finding, finding the grateful things I was really good at and, um, and unlocking that, that like self power empowerment within me. And I had not started doing like the, the personal development stuff at that point. Um, and not like implementing it. I had obviously known about it, but I hadn't started implementing it with the exception of manifesting. I started thinking about like, what is it like to manifest? What is it like to manifest this role? What is it like to manifest this opportunity? And things started really happening. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I feel good at this. I feel really empowered by this. Mm. Mm -hmm. So after this experience, you know, was that kind of the one of like the last really negative experience as far as, you know, abuse and stuff like that after this relationship, did anything continue? Or was that like the moment things kind of started healing for you? after physical abuse for another person. Yes. Luckily that was like absolutely done mental abuse from a partner. That was also with the exception of like maybe a cheater (laughs) down the line, but like Mm. there were, uh, so there were moments there, but, um, actually ended up through, through the, the relationship with the like Sasquatch and stuff like that. He would also make a lot of comments about my body, So, so during this time, even though I was finding my own voice, I was also really self-conscious about what I looked like. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's kind of like this opposition working together in tandem. Um, so I went on to college and I actually ended up going to a college that did weigh-ins. Um, 
What? Where, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Like the whole college or certain the certain, groups or? certain programs. So our uh, dance school was like the heaviest weighted weigh-ins. So basically a lot of their scholarships and their roles and their performing opportunities relied on staying in between a five pound weight. And of course oh. we're coming in as 18 year olds. We're leaving as 22 typically. And your body does so much changing in that time. You're also on your own for the first time. And, um, I, I will just say, I won't, I won't say it so blanketly, but I will say most people, I don't know a single person who didn't, but I will say most people walked out of that college with some form of eating disorder or disordered oh relationship with eating. Yeah. And, um, so the dance school was very heavily affected. Musical theater was pretty heavily affected as well. Cause we also did a lot of dance classes. That's the program I was in. And then the actors also did it. It was a little bit less intense, but still it was something you stepped on every six weeks. I believe I've, I, I can't remember exactly, but it was like always right after Thanksgiving. That's the one I remember the most clearly, like always right after Thanksgiving and people would like not eat or not drink any water for like a 24 hour period. And it was oh just like, God. it was not encouraged to like starve yourself, obviously from the faculty. I want to make that very clear, but yeah, you know, the, the, the pressure underneath that is, is loud. What, how would I, how would weight dictate your roles in musical theater? I can't even m- wrap my head around why that would it's, even be the case. People, and I, I won't say the whole, the whole system's changing right now. There's a lot of waking up to this right now, which I'm so unbelievably grateful for. But for a while, if you looked at Broadway, it was skinny, 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 unless it was the quote funny person, which just makes me gag so much. Um, I have not been in the theater world for quite some time now, so I'm very disconnected from what's going on with it. So I won't speak too much into what's going on right now, but the school I went to was very, and many schools, this is not just, just linked to them, but we're very about like making sure the person look aesthetically pleasing, which in our society, a lot of times equates to skinny, which is Mm -hmm. so untrue and so unfortunate. Um, but that, that happened to be a large part of the, the, program that the dancers, especially in a a pie slice of ours for sure too, but it was definitely on everyone's minds. Those six weeks mark marks. Mm. So, so this, do do you, so did this trigger some disordered eating for you? Definitely. I college. Luckily I had really coming, coming into school. Definitely. I around my sophomore, excuse me, around my junior year, well, actually here. So, um, backstory, I feel like I'm just telling sad story. I've, I've promised I've had a good life guys. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so it's just what you've been through, I think is just so incredibly relatable on so many different levels, Mm -hmm. like all the things that you are hitting bullying and an abusive relationship, disordered eating. These are things that I know that our community has written in about so many of these things, whether more than one or one, you know, individually. And I just, I know that you're helping a lot of people right now by, by sharing. So we'll get to the lighter stuff later. No. <laughs> you want to keep, keep digging deep, go ahead, Dig whatever deep. you're comfortable well, lucky, with. And luckily I've done, I've done so much healing around this. We're talking about this and speaking out about it feels so, so I, I won't say natural, but it feels so it's, it's not about me. It's about how can someone feel less alone? Mm-hmm. And I actually had to keep reminding myself before we hopped on the show. I was like, okay, like, cause a little bit of that emotions are a burden sort of thing kind of kept on coming up. And I was like, Whoa, we do not subscribe to that anymore. No ma'am. Right. Like hold on. So let's identify where this is really coming from. And I really tapped into that. But, uh, to go back to what we were talking about, I actually in, in college, I, so I, was in the musical theater program. My confidence was, was very low when I walked, when I went in much lower than other people while I was really finding my voice, finding my body image attractive and really leaning into that. And, and just believing in myself as a singer, as a performer, when I was surrounded by these other people, I started getting really into comparison and that, that, which I know so many people deal with, especially right now with social media, Um, that was just like really prevalent. And my voice teacher actually ended up sitting me down and saying, Hey, my junior year, he said, Hey, um, just so you know, because of your confidence and because of where your levels are at singing wise, 
because of the, that confidence, you're either going to need to get your levels up, which at that point was kind of like performing a miracle or like sacrificing five goats, like good luck. Mm -hmm. And the other option was leave, switch programs, do a different major. And I was just like, that was my moment of like, no, absolutely not. I literally looked him in the face and he's he's a gorgeous, sweet man. He was like, he was like crying with me. He was like, it's okay. Like we're going to figure this out. He was so sweet about it. But I remember looking him straight in the face and saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this happen. I don't know how, I don't know where, I don't know how, why, who, what, who was going to like bestow upon my body to do this, but I am <laughs> yeah. going to do this no matter what. And that's when I actually called my dad. I like ran down to the practice room and I called my dad. who's like I said, at the beginning, he's a life coach. And I was just like, I do not need dad right now. I need coach. And I started coaching with him and implementing, like I've been talking about, I really, this is when I really started implementing everything, not just manifesting every element of it, energy work, uh, releasing of control, stepping into my physiology, like all this, all this big stuff. And when I started implementing all of that over time, it was not overnight. I want to make that very, very clear, but over about a year and a half, my levels were like steadily going up until the very last one where it was like, like it was like it was two days before graduation. I was waiting outside of the the jury room where they are deliberating and they come out and my voice teacher just looks at me and he's like, I don't know how you did it. And I like leapt into his arms. I started crying. And that's when I really saw this stuff works. This stuff really works. So that's when one of my friends actually told me, she's like, you might be really good at this like inspirational mumbo jumbo. And I was like, I'll do that after <laughs> acting. I'll do it after acting. Lo and behold, here I am. So, um, yeah. Does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a, so the moment when, when somebody, when this teacher, this um, instructor said, Hey, basically get better or move on kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, right. in not so many words. Yeah. Did you take that as this is about my voice and my performance or did you, th did you take it as it's the way I look, it's my self-worth? How were you able to differentiate mm -hmm. what that, that they were saying to you or, or, or did you feel that way that it was more, more than just your voice after, you know, many years of what had been happening? I had had enough enough cry sessions with my, my, my wonderful father to know that it was not just my voice. Um, because based off the way that I was talking to him, whenever I was in those practice rooms, which if for people who didn't go to theater schools or, or any like art schools, you're required, not required, but you're strongly encouraged to be in the practice rooms, probably about like three to four hours a day. And I was there and my dad would just be able to hear my timbre of voice. I mean, I was talking kind of like this and I was really sad. And he's, it's like, it was, there was no way it was anything but my mindset, my, like what was going on up here and my belief systems um, that was affecting my voice because the way my dad kept putting it, he was like, you got into this program, you've got the chops. It's what's going on in your mind. That's the self-sabotaging thing. He said this with much mm -hmm. more love, obviously, but mm -hmm. um but so when, by the time that my instructor sat me down, I had had kind of enough, like, Ooh, this, like putting pieces together to know, like, this is much deeper. This is my own view of my own self empowerment and trusting my voice and putting myself on, on this playing field. That's not 10 yards lower than everyone else. I am rising up to meet the, the occasion. And like I said, with much, much, much work on myself, that's when stuff really started to kick into high gear. Okay. So what specifically did you implement just for people who are not familiar with a lot of the personal development stuff out there? Can you remember like the first baby step you took and kind of take us through that process? It may not have been the first baby step, but I can remember the one that impacted me the most. Um, it's something, something in the personal development world called the triad. And it's where we look at your physiology basically like how your body is placed in the moment, your language, how you're talking to yourself, the language you're using outside of yourself. So the language you're saying to other people and your focus, are you focusing on being the best in the room? Are you focusing on putting this insanely high pressure on yourself? Are you focused on totally tanking, forgetting the words and mm. cracking on the high note? Or are you focused on just letting things flow and just letting things be easy? And mm -hmm. When I started to tap into those three things, so like the first one would be like how I'm breathing. 
a lot of the times when we're shallow and I hear this now a lot with my, or not shallow, but when we're, um, when we're in a down place, when we're really hard on ourselves. And I hear this a lot on the calls with my, my clients, when we're talking about really hard stuff, they'll, they'll kind of be breathing a little bit up here for people who aren't watching on YouTube. It's like, like right up in your chest. It's like Mm -hmm. not full deep diaphragmic breaths. And you can notice when those are happening and it's affecting their vocal timbre. It's affecting their clarity that what they're thinking It's affecting their shoulders are probably going down. Their head's probably going down. And I actually literally, oh, I'm, I'm like, just, I'm doing it. I'm like, okay, how's my <laughs> breath and posture? Let me just, <laughs> yes. But when we, when we adjust yeah, that, like you can call it, you can call it power posing, but it's a little bit on a deeper level. Um, you know, like I, I would say with my clients, like starfish, uh, Patrick star, so like taking up, I just hit my window, like taking up <laughs> space, like throwing your hands out in the air and just like making you feel like you deserve to be here, making you feel grounded and big. And so that's with uh, physiology, with language, we worked a lot on affirmations or I, I have, I have a back and forth uh, relationship with the word affirmations. Cause a lot of the times people will hear like affirmation. So it's like, I am enough. I am enough. I am good. I am great. I'm a happy human. I am. The world is my oyster, whatever. (laughs) And if you say it like that, there's diddly squats going to happen. Like, and yet we're expecting our mindset to totally change just because we say I am happy. Like, and yet it's not going to happen. My my voice will usually respond like you're full of shit. Do you even want this stuff? Like it has to be an affirmation that resonates with me. You know, it's hard. That's literally your subconscious is going, you're full of shit right Right. there. Like, that's like, (laughs) exactly what's going on. And so instead it's putting your vote, your voice behind it. So it, that's why it's so connected with physiology. It's changing your breathing to get your voice louder and more powerful and more present. And when you're able to say it with motion and with your body engaged, like I am happy is a lot different than I am happy. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. so that's, so when I say affirmations, I mean, really engaging the whole, Mm -hmm. uh, your whole body when you do that. And then with focus, rather than focusing on me totally tanking and forgetting the words and then totally self-fulfilling that prophecy, we ended up focusing on like letting things flow, letting things feel easy, letting things feel like they're just like, I keep on saying vomiting, but vomiting out of me, like where it's just like, it was so effortless. Mm -hmm. And those, those, that, that triad thing. I mean, I work on this with my clients still to this day because it's something we're not really taught. and yet it's the difference between someone who is clearly in in a state of stress or anxiety, like, or like, um, feeling like really down or hard on themselves versus the difference of someone who is like, I am feeling on top of the world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So was it, was it your dad who was coaching you through all of this? Yes. Which is which was weird. <laughs> I have to know. I have to know about that dynamic. I didn't even know what a life yeah. coach was at this age that this was happening to you. And then, yeah. So, can you share about that experience? It was. It was weird at first. Let me. Let me rephrase. It was weird at first because sometimes my dad would like call me out on stuff that I was like, oh, Dad, like <laughs> why? And he was like, and he he would always pause. He's like, Do you want dad or coach? Do you want? And he was, he was very, he was very, very sweet with that, but yeah. he could tell that if I was like really on the brink of something big, he would, he would either push me. He would never like yell or anything, but he would ask me those questions that I'm just like, I don't, I don't like you right now. Like, I don't yeah. want to answer that. <laughs> like, and, but it, 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 it provided that breakthrough. And I think who I, I heard a coach say it was a running coach, but I was like, oh, that works for life coaching too. Is like, the, the coach said, I have the right to be annoying right now. That is my right as a coach. I have the right to be annoying. And uh, that was, he, my dad stuck that ground. He had the <laughs> right to be annoying. Um, but it's in the best way. And now still to this day, um, like sometimes I'll call him and just be like, I, Hey, I need coach. Mm. And, and now I, now I know the, I, I have a background in neuro-linguistic programming now, which is his background. Cause he trained under the people who invented it. And so he, I now like notice how he phrases things and like sees his, his little thing. So I'm like, I, I see what you did there. And yeah. like, I can't coach you anymore because you can catch me on these little things. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So when like d- with your dad, like coaching you, did you ever feel like you were withholding any information because it was your dad? Like, like answering hard questions like, oh, what if this makes my dad feel bad? It might not make the coach feel bad, but like 
what if this hurts my dad's feelings? Did you ever have to do that? I didn't because I was that desperate to change. Mm. I was, I knew that he was a resource that I needed to utilize. And I was just like, if this is going to work, I need to like, sometimes he said things and it stung a little deeper because it was my dad rather than a coach, but it always provided that, that level on the other side. Or I would be like, Hey, I didn't appreciate that. And then he would be like, okay, here's what he would always explain. Here's what I'm doing. And that would make my brain. I think you guys have done the four tendencies on here before. I'm a Mm -hmm. big questioner. Mm -hmm. So knowing the why behind it, I would be like, okay, you are allowed to ask that question now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, so it, it was, it was never, it was never like, I never would get angry with him per se, but there were definitely moments where I was like, I, I love you, but I don't like you right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Do you have, do you have any siblings, Nicole? I do. I have an older sister. And has she ever hit your dad up for coaching? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he's, that's so funny. he's coach Baker. So I, yeah. or he'd be call him life coach Baker. So when I told one of my clients that one time, cause I, I, my, my business is called life coach Baker. And she's like, so it's really like life coach Baker jr. Is what you're saying. <laughs> like, you're like, not the OG. Re- and re- I was like, no. <laughs> rebrand. <laughs> oh boy. How does your, how does, how does your dad feel about you being a coach now? He at least as far as I've gathered, and he's not one to bullshit ever. He is so proud. I mean, just like to be able to share this information and have these conversations. There's been moments where like, if um, I know that he's like leading a webinar or something and he's going to practice, I'll like sit in on his practice and be able to take notes. Mm. And it's, it's such a whole level of bonding for us that I never really thought was not, not that I thought was going to happen. Like I've always been really close with my parents, but um, this just like totally took us all to a new level. And same with my mom. Cause she, uh, also worked in the personal development industry. She was a logistics coordinator for so long for like mm. the seminars. Oh, and wow. so she would catch me on language and she'd be like, Hey, like, I noticed how you said that. That's what... she's probably the biggest fan of my podcast. I shout <laughs> to mom. She's the best. I love you. Um, she's like my biggest cheerleader, but they have both been so, so supportive, which is not normal for an entrepreneur, for someone who's about to like, be like, I'm going to ditch my nine to five. I'm going to go be my own boss and throw everything out on the line. Most people be like, you're crazy. Like, what are you doing? But they were so supportive. They were like, got it. You got to do this. So, okay. So by focusing on the triad, which we've, I don't think we've ever really talked about on self-helpless or, you know, we've talked about these in maybe different, different ways of saying it, Mm -hmm. but so by focusing on your body, your language, and your focus, would you say that's that's what those three things were keeping you present with what was going on with you? Was there any other any other things that you implemented to kind of give yourself this transformation of like it sounded like you kind of went from not having much confidence in yourself to having all this confidence where people you you stayed in your program, people noticed a mm-hmm. significant change in you. So what uh, what else happened in between there? You know. I believe it was my senior year of college. Um, I, I had not, well, actually, let me, let me rephrase. There was a time before that I was in a sorority in college, which I know sometimes sororities get a bad name. This was like a super small school and like sorority was like your like family. They were always just like the best, best humans. And I remember getting rushed into the sorority and the philanthropy was domestic violence awareness and I was really like, oh God, like I'm, I'm scared. Like I, this was when I was 18. I was like two years out of this relationship. And I was like, ah, oh God, I don't know. Um, if I want to want to like really lean into that because I was still really scared, but after learning about what the philanthropy did to help women and what the, the process was for some women to like, like what, what some women were going through, we like heard all these stories I finally went to the exec board my sophomore year, I believe. And I sat them down and I was like, can I tell you guys something? Now, granted, I had not told anyone except for my two best friends in in high school. And so I sat them down and I told them what was going on. And they were, they were like, so, so incredible. They were like in tears. We were all like just having this beautiful bonding moment. And I felt like 10 pounds 
released off of my shoulders. Like it was just like that release of like having bottled that up for so long. And they looked at me and they said, do you mind giving a speech about this? Oh, wow. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> I just did. I just, I just told you guys, like, I am so scared. And I was like, I appreciate it. Let me think about it. Like, let me really think about this. And, um, I had never been a speaker. Like I had been performing, like that's just a totally different thing in my book. And I never learned anything about speaking, but they, they, something in me was just like, do it, do it, do it, do it. And so I went up in front of all these women and I, I gave him the speech and I, I want to be very clear. It was not this like movie moment where it was like the violins start playing and she like goes, <laughs> totally gets into flow. And she like totally tells everyone and they're just all engaged. Right. I was horrible. I was <laughs> stuttering. My hands were shaking. Mm. I was probably talking like this because I was just so scared, not of telling, not of being vulnerable, but of telling the story and just, well, no, actually probably being vulnerable. I was really just scared of laying this out on the line. And I remember like sitting down afterward and this girl comes up to me and she goes, thank you so much for sharing. Can I tell you a story? And these women started telling me their experiences with abusive partners, physically, uh, mentally on all scales, like all these insane stories that like, I was just in tears by the time we were done. And this happened night after night after night. And it was in that moment where I was like, oh my God, there's so much power in, in banding together. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I had continued this, this, this chat for a while where I had really done so much of the healing through the relationship, through bonding with these women. So by the time I was in senior year of college, I had already started implementing these, these, uh, like self-worth techniques, like really starting to step into my own power. And the guy that I was in a relationship long, long ago, whoops, the guy I was in a relationship with long ago reached out to me and he said like, Hey, this is really out of the blue. I would like to meet up. Like oh, wow. the, I want the one that was abusive to you. The, nice. the guy who was abusive. Oh wow. Reached out. And I had like, I had never like blocked him on Facebook. I'd always kind of like kept up to date with him. Um, part of it was out of like hoping that he would maybe fall on his face and like explode a little bit, but that's, that's a, uh-huh. that's a little bit of fear and reject or like, um, uh, what's, I can't remember the word I'm thinking of, but he reached out to me and there was a part of me that was just like, do it. And I want to be very clear for listeners. I, something in me was just like, I think that this is the right thing to do. This is not a total one size fits all. Right. Thing. Very I case by case recommend- basis. Very Disclaimer. Case case. Yeah. No, nobody's encouraging you to meet up with your abusive former partner. Please, yeah. <laughs> like, please, yeah. please, please, please. Um, but I what, texted, what okay. signaled to you that it would be maybe a good idea? Did you feel like enough time had passed? You felt safe with the setting you were going to be meeting in. Do you want to expand on that a little bit, Nicole? Totally. Um, I felt safe with the setting. Definitely enough time had passed and I had def- done enough healing where if I knew, I knew that in that setting, I would have been safe. I like just something in my gut was just like, you're going to be safe here. And also I had heard from friends who, <laughs> flat out told him you were a dick to Nicole. Like you were horrible. You did X, Y, and Z. And he was like, what? So I think, and he was like telling my friends would be telling me like, he's really full of remorse. Like, you know, feel free to forgive him or don't like, you know, really you do you. Mm. But so I knew that that was, that was kind of top of mind. And I had a nudge that that was what this conversation was going to be about. So I texted three of my friends. I shared my location with them. I was like, what? Like, playing worst case scenario for a second. Here you go. Like just in case. And I went and met up with him and we sat down and it was like pleasant conversation for a second. And then he was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for everything that happened. I'm so sorry. Like, well, I'm just like, kind of really just let it all out. And, um, he was like, I didn't know what I was doing. I know that's not an excuse. I can't believe I did this to you. Like, I, I hope, you know, I never want to do that to anyone else ever again. Like, I know you don't need to forgive me, but I just need you to know all of this. And I, I looked at him and I had no plan of what I was going to say, which was surprising because I'm a major type A planner. <laughs> like, 
kind of my MO. Um, but he, he said all those things and I was just like, I will never forgive the person who did those things to me. Mm. But what I am ready for to forgive is the woman who went through them. And I wish I could say like, like got up and like left at that moment, but I didn't. (laughs) And Uh, that's the podcast. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But we, we, the fizzle, the really, the, um, what am I saying? The, the conversation kind of fizzled from there, but that was really the big, the big moment where I was like, I am ready to forgive this girl. And without even knowing it, there's in, in neurolinguistic programming, there's a, a process called Ho'oponopono which is a very fancy way of saying the Hawaiian way of forgiveness, um, which I know can sound a little woo-woo, but stay with me. (laughs) Um, It's this process of looking at someone who, whether in your mind or in reality, looking at someone who you, you haven't given forgiveness to and saying the words, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. And just over and over and over again and pouring that into them. And it, without even realizing, I went home and I just started journaling and I started writing, like, I'm sorry for going through that. I'm sorry for believing that this was normal. I'm sorry for listening to myself over others. I'm sorry for all these, all these different things. Please forgive me for not raising the alarm, not realizing sooner, allowing this to stay with me for so long, allowing myself to keep it bottled up for not telling my parents for like all these things that just came out of me. Um, I love you for going through this, the skin you, you, um, built going through this experience. Um, the, the, the ability to love so deeply still and to, to have a partner right now, who's just this incredible, incredible human. And what was it? I'm sorry. I love you. Please. Uh, please. <laughs> yeah. like, blah, blah, blah. And, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for for, for going through that. So I could learn this lesson, like, thank you for being there. And thank you for waking up when you did like all of this stuff. And I'm probably forgetting, it was like a very long journal session and I'm forgetting a lot of it, but that was the moment that I was just like, I'm really allowed to forgive myself for this. And I actually went upstairs and the next morning and I was staying with my parents at the time I sat them down and I was like, I need to tell you guys something and told them the whole thing. And they were sad, obviously, but I told him the healing that I had done the night prior. And they were just like, oh my God, like, like I, it was probably a lot to lay on two people who birthed <laughs> you, you know, like, um, but it was such a, like, it was like a, it was the closing of a circle and I have not talked to him. I have not met up with him since I, to be quite honest, have no desire to, mm-hmm. um, that was really what I needed and the closure that I needed. And it was, so wonderful. So I do recommend if someone who, who has done a little bit of healing with it, I do not recommend doing this exercise right after, like while the wound is still open and fresh, Mm. but maybe while like a few scabs or maybe a scar has come over and you still notice if you haven't tapped into that forgiveness to yourself, and it doesn't have to be with an abusive relationship. It can be having gone through a, um, I mean, I I've, I've done this exercise with people who, uh, went through a divorce, who, um, went through body image dysmorphia, who, um, just like totally shut down after, um, after leaving a college program, that was something that they loved and just really like leaned into like, I mean, it can be so many different things, but the exercises I'm sorry for, please forgive me for, I love you for, and thank you for. So, this was basically your present self forgiving your past self yes, for not being there for yourself in a way. Yeah. Interesting. So he, you, you couldn't, or you, you couldn't forgive the person that did that to you, which makes a lot of sense. Very valid, but you were forgiving you for not taking that different care of yourself back then basically. And, and letting it stay with me for so long. I think that was, that was the biggest part for letting that shadow kind of live behind me. And I will say I was also able to forgive the person who was sitting in front of me that day. Mm. I was able to forgive that version of him, which Mm. I think is very unique to my situation. I don't think that that's, um, because mine, my, my abuser had really realized the remorse and the, the, 
the he he'd woken up to it from from what I'd gather I don't don't need to talk to his therapist or anything to know the details of it but like mm-hmm. I I just yeah, I, that, that was really the biggest healing was not, not anything to do with him. I was disconnected enough from him in the situation, but the girl who hid the bruises, the girl who, um, lied about being hurt and shaved her arms, that girl, that shadow was behind me still to that day. And to be able to really look at her and hug her and say, I love you. Thank you. You're so God. I'm like getting choked up thinking about this experience. Like it, like I it was almost just like giving her a big hug and letting her go. Mm-hmm. And that was so powerful. Huh. Wow. That's that it like you've given people so many really great exercises and things to think about. I'm curious, what about the people who might be feeling in this moment like Nicole, you don't have to forgive yourself. You know, it's, it's that person who did this to you and it's society who made you feel this way. And it's those girls who hurt you in the bathroom. It's all of their fault. It's not Hmm. your fault. Why are you forgiving yourself? You have nothing to be sorry for. Do you want to explain your point of view with that? I I will. Yes. And oh, what a good question. Um, the way I look at it is I can blame and blame and blame and blame and blame until the cows come home. And what is that? What's that? What's that saying? The, um, ha, something about drinking poison and watching and hoping oh, the other person dies. Resent, resentment is like resentment drinking poison yourself and hoping the other person dies. Something like that. It, right? it's, it's something just so close to that. And yeah. I think there's so much to say about being angry with that. And I think that there's nothing wrong. I'm, I'm still angry at those twins who locked me in the bathroom. If I saw them, I probably wouldn't say hi and I'd probably walk the other way, but Mm. not out of a place of fear, out of a place of you just, you're not even a part of who I am anymore, Mm. where you don't rule over me in a way that's a shadow or a demon. You rule, you, you're a part of my story of, of like a Phoenix rising from the ashes. And so I honestly, this is, this might not, a lot of people might not agree with it and that's okay, but I almost thank them for these mm-hmm. experiences because not because they happened and thank you so much. That was so nice of you for locking me in the bathroom and beating me up. I appreciate it. Right. Not like that at all. Like, right. be clear. But, but for giving me the, the, there, there's no way I would be at this point in my life. I, I would be in the, in the coaching position that I'm in. I would be at the level of the coaching position that I'm in at a very young age, Um, I would have the incredible fiance. I can now say my incredible fiance. Like I would not be able to say like, he is the person I get to spend my life with. If it was not for all of these experiences, or I wouldn't be able to look at the relationship I now have with my parents, which is so close and my, my sister and my friends and really like choosing the people I hang out with wisely. Like I could go on and on and on, but there's so many instances that came out of this that I now see were such a part of a bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Do I wish those experiences on anyone and they have to have those experiences in order to learn these stuff? No, not at all. But I don't blame them for anything because I don't want to carry that anger or that weight with me. My life is too short to feel that like tightness in my chest for something that was so long ago when in actuality, I'm the one who stuck with me for the rest of my life. So if I feel any attachment to those experiences in a negative way, what can I do to heal those? I don't know. That's Mm -hmm. a very like kind of talking around in a lot of different ways, but. No, it's great. um, I have so many ideas with that that, (laughs) that question. (laughs) Well, you kind of hit, (laughs) you just hit on what I was going to ask you about. It's like, well, where you are now, you're recently engaged. You just went full-time in your coaching business. You are, you have are building and have built an incredible life for yourself. And it's just going to, you know, keep going from there. So I think it's, it's really fascinating that you've really given yourself this huge transformation when it comes to your self-worth, your confidence, you even said, you know, forgiving your past self. Mm -hmm. And now you help other people have the same transformation. You build other people's, you help them build up their self-worth so they can have similar, you know, those, those goals or those things that they want, um, you know, they have the courage to go after them. So that's really just a full circle moment, right? It's (laughs) honestly, I know this sounds like, so like Disney movie and I already sound like a little bit of a Disney princess, but like, um, it's so like, 
that's really just the biggest gift of all is to be able to look at these incredible people I work with and to, to reach them on a level of compassion and empathy and really talk to them where they're at and knowing that these experiences that I've gone through have, have given me the tools to now help these women not feel like they have that demon, not feel like they have that shadow, not feel like they have to close their mouth and not speak or use their own voice or put others on a pedestal, which is, is why like perfectionism really called to me, which is I, you and I, you and I really found, found that calling through me together, but like having that, that, that those, those types of people I get to work with now is like, I, 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 again, Disney movie, but like a dream come true, which I just can't believe I'm saying <laughs> yeah. at like whatever age I am, you know, <laughs> that's where oh, we're at today. It's great. Well, we are, we're wrapping up and I, uh, I just want to say it's been incredible to watch. I've been able to see so much of this transformation right before my eyes as you know, your business coach. And I absolutely love you. And I see how hard you've worked for all of this. And I've seen you do this really deep, difficult work. And I believe that's why you have been so incredibly successful so quickly that it just in a year, you went from this seed of an idea and a dream to making it happen and now you are living this dream that you had now full time. And so it's just been very inspiring for me to watch your whole transformation. And I'm really proud of you. And I, I love the way that you, you learn something and you implement it and you, you do it quickly. And I know that that took a lot of practice and a lot of unlearning and building up your self-worth and it worked. It's, but it's working. So, <laughs> so I'm very proud of you. <laughs> That's what I'm that, saying. Oh, uh, you're going to make me cry and blush and just pee of joy and gratitude for you. I just, I, I'm so grateful for you and to be able to come on here and share this story. Like, well, like I said earlier, I was, I was scared and I'm, I'm sweating uh, <laughs> talking about this, but like, it's so thank you for, for honestly pushing me out of a little bit, my comfort zone shocking. That's what you do all the time, uh, <laughs> but like pushing me out of my comfort zone and, and sharing these stories. I'm honestly yeah. just so grateful and I hope this helps. So oh, yes, absolutely. Here. Well, Nicole, before we go, I uh, love to ask, you know, how do you personally practice self-care, whether it's in your day to day or something you've done recently for yourself? You know, you have a good shit moment you want to share with our community. A, a self care. I'll do self care because I'm I'm going to be one of those really annoying people that preaches the the good word about the morning routine, um, <laughs> which I know, which I I want to always preface because when it, people hear morning routine, they're like, oh, oh, okay, another person telling me I need to wake up at five a.m. Right, like journal for forty five minutes, go on a fucking marathon run, like right. all this stuff, and it's like I no, <laughs> that's not the case at all. What it is is it's whatever time makes sense for you and your schedule and your own mental psyche to wake up at and to do something for an hour, to do something for 30 minutes, to do something for two hours, doesn't matter, but that will set you up for the day. So some people, I used to work at a restaurant for 12 years. Like I, there's no way I could wake up at 5 a.m. So instead mm -hmm. it was like my 10 a.m. wake up. But my, my self-care now, to make my, my long story short, um, I've started waking up at 5.30 um, and doing like a little bit of reading, a little bit of writing and meditation, and then going into a little bit of like movement. I'm a big runner. So moving my body through, through running or strength training and then, and then heading into my day. And I noticed such a huge difference in my energy and how I'm showing up. So um, if you don't mind, I also have for people who are like, I don't know where to even fucking start with a morning routine. Mm -hmm. I have a morning routine. It's totally free. It's a morning routine workbook. That's like nine pages. It goes through the different categories that work for a morning routine. Um, but those are like the umbrella categories. You can make them really personalized to you. And there's questions and prompts to help you do that. So if you don't mind, I'm happy to yeah. gift that to any of your listeners. I'll send you the the code and everything for that. Beautiful. Yes. Amazing. And then on that note, where can people find you, your, you know, your website, your podcast, all of the things. Uh, my website is lifecoachbaker.com. I am also primarily on Instagram at lifecoachbaker. 
And I also have a podcast, which is shockingly called the Life Coach Baker Podcast. So <laughs> Not going to add just, Junior on the end of that? <laughs> I don't know. My dad might get me. And I'm like, <laughs> um, but literally, if you just Google Life Coach Baker, you'll find all of my stuff. Everything's on there. Amazing. Well, Nicole, yeah. thank you so much for doing the show today and opening up uh, about all the things that you did. And I'll be talking to you very soon. Thank you so much for having me. And it's a delight to always talk to you, Delaney Fisher. <laughs> I hope you got as much out of this episode with Nicole as I did. Thank you again to Nicole for coming on here and being willing to be so vulnerable and share so much of herself with me and our community. I do want to wrap up with an iTunes review of the episode. This is from Taryn Gators 12, and it says, this podcast gives me so much joy and insight. I just found it, so I've been binging from the beginning. These women are so relatable, honest, and hilarious. It's definitely the pick-me-up I needed with all of the chaos and sadness in the world. Thank you so much, Taryn. Uh, very much appreciated that you took the time to leave that sweet review. Um, if you would like to leave a review for the show, you can head over to iTunes. We read one on every single episode and it definitely helps the show. It helps more people find it and just continues to grow um, our community. And we're just, you know, you guys are the heart and soul of this podcast. So we really appreciate it and um, enjoy reading these reviews as they come in. And then I just want to give an announcement that if you are an entrepreneur, business owner, freelancer, service provider who is interested in building, restructuring, scaling your business or project, utilizing a minimalist approach to your offer, your marketing, and your operations, I invite you to apply for a 15-minute call with me to discuss the goals you have for your business further. You can head over to DelaneyFisher.com for all of the information. I absolutely love the work I do as a business simplicity coach, and I get to work with people like Nicole on building and growing their dream careers. Um, and I've had the privilege of watching people leave their day jobs to do their dream job full time, doubling and tripling their income, getting featured in major publications, going viral on social media, getting shout outs from their favorite celebrities and influencers, increasing their podcast audience significantly, hitting the top iTunes charts. And if you've been listening to Self Helpless for a while, then you know how much starting and scaling my own business has completely changed my life and how lost I used to feel with not knowing what I wanted to do and kind of feeling stuck in a career that was not making me happy. And making this change has enabled me to pivot away from the jobs that I used to have that were not a great fit for me. And I really love helping other people with this transformation. So if you are feeling stuck in your business, come and talk to me. I'd love to meet you. And that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for listening to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and our individual work at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you shared this episode with a friend or feel free to post it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say thank you. 